Well, everyone, today's episode is sponsored by the Plant DNA Sex Testing Kit from Delta Leaf Labs. Now, I know a lot of growers that'll say they can tell me with 90% accuracy just by looking at the plant, whether it's a male or a female plant. Okay. But can they tell by just looking at the cotyledon leaves? Now, those are the first two round little leaves that a cannabis seedling is going to push out. They're called the cotyledon leaves. Because I know for a fact that I can take a sample of one of those leaves. All I have to do is go over there and snip one off with some sharp scissors. Then I take that little leaf sample, and I'm going to mash it down on that testing strip and make a stain. Because that's all I'm going to send in is that stained testing strip. Okay, I'm not going to send in that mashed up piece of leaf. The lab doesn't need it, and I don't need it, so I just throw it away. I'm going to send that sample in, and a couple of days after Delta Leaf Labs gets it, they're going to be able to tell me whether I've got a male or a female plant. Just by using those two little cotyledon leaves. And the sooner I know that, the better it is for me, because that's going to save me time on that plant, and that's going to save me money on that plant. So go over to DeltaLeafLabs.com and order your plant and DNA sex testing kit. And at checkout, use promo code IMGS10 to get 10% off of that order. Now also, you know that raw CBD oil is good for you. You know that it helps with your joints. You know that it helps you sleep. But did you realize that it's also just as good for your pets, for your dogs and your cats? And 101CBD.org has the flavors that they're going to love. They've got a bacon flavor for dogs, which I can attest to really does taste like bacon because I have tried it for one. And two, I do give that to my dog Dante. And they also have a salmon flavor for the cats. So go over to 101CBD.org and pick up some raw CBD oil for your dog or your cat. And at checkout, you can use coupon code IMGS25 to get 25% off of that order. All right, now let's get the show started. Brothers and sisters, welcome back to the In My Grow Show. This is the podcast dedicated to taking the mystery out of cannabis. Once again, I'm your host, Alex. And I don't know about you, but it's fucking hot in Ojai. I mean, you know, it's not like 115 hot like uh, my buddy Matt told me it was in Philadelphia. But it's still hot. I'm not that kind of Mexican. I'm a tropical kind of Mexican. I'm not this desert heat kind of Mexican. I can't. I can't jive with it. I have to stay indoors with um, some nice conditioned air. Now, don't forget, if you are growing outside when it is really hot in the summertime, make sure to add a little bit of uh, a little bit extra silica in your uh, feeding regimen for your plants. That silica is really going to help those plants deal with the drought-like conditions that are going on. They really are. They're really going to help them deal with that heat. So just add a little bit more silica. You know, not too much more. I don't even know if you can, if there's an actual toxic level for silica. I mean, I'm sure there is, right? I mean, too much of anything isn't a good thing. Maybe. I don't know. Oh, but you know what? Here's an interesting thing. I'm going to have David Neal on, and he's the he's the founder of Dynagrow. I'm going to have him on, and he's like knows all this stuff about silica. I'm going to ask him about that, see if there's like a toxic level of silica. But yeah, that's going to be in a couple of weeks. I'm going to talk to him. But like I said, just add a little more silica to your plant's diet. They're going to love you for it. And before I get any further, I want to thank all of you. I want to thank you, specifically you, for all the support you've shown me you know, online, whether it's on social media or subscribing to the website in mygrow.com or to the YouTube channel. Thank you very much. I truly appreciate it. I appreciate all the, the, the great comments, man, for sure. Now, speaking of the website, if you go over to inmygrow.com slash books, you'll see a list of the books that I've used that are in my library right now that I still use. You know, I've got a couple up there from Jorge Cervantes. Um, of course, I've got Greg Green's book. You know, the Cannabis Grow Bible, that one was a real big help in helping me understand the cannabis plant. It's also got this really cool uh, reference section in the front as far as like the lineage of a lot of cannabis. It does get pretty, you know, wordy and kind of boring in that part. I mean, you know, as exciting as a grow book can be. But it's a great resource for that kind of information. Man. Um, I used his second edition, I believe. Right now they've got the third edition out. Which is really good because it's just updated on like LED technology and a hydroponic technology, you know, stuff that wasn't in the last edition. So, anyways, go over there, check it out, check out any, check out those books, uh, pick one up. Like I said, those are just the ones that helped me, you know, become a better grower and helped me understand not just the plants but you know the whole garden outside. Yeah, so go over there and check it out. Those are just some of my favorite, you know, resource books on cannabis that are up. I'll probably be adding more later. I haven't gone through the whole library. Later in this episode, I am going to be talking to Mr. Joe Grow, and that was an awesome conversation that I had with him. That's a little later. And before I really get started into the show, I want to thank my buddy Rooster once again for helping me out with my logo. 
I needed, you know, the name of the show put under the logo. He had helped me out originally with the logo itself. Once again, Rooster, thank you, brother, very much, man. I appreciate it. It came out awesome. I love the way it looks. So I don't have a strain of the week today because, well, to be quite honest, I'm not really smoking anything new this week. Um, I've got some Cherry AK that I'm smoking on, which, you know, I love. And I've still got some of that Northern Lights left over for my, you know, my Indica fix. But I will talk a little bit about uh, uh, vape cartridges again. I haven't had a vape cartridge in a long time. I don't know, maybe like six months, maybe was the last time I had a vape cartridge. And somebody had gifted me this cartridge by a company called uh, Centurion. And it was a sativa cartridge. It didn't say anything specific as far as what the, as far as what the strain was. Um, but the same kind of thing, you know. Once again, vape cartridges don't really get me high. They get me stoned, like lightly stoned, but not high. And those aren't the same things to me. Um, when I get high, it's that like first 20 minutes when I first smoke that flower. You know, I feel high. The high comes on. Pow! Rawr, you know, and I'm like, oh crap. Then after about 25 minutes, 30 minutes, you know, kind of plateaus off. And I'm like, okay, this is the way it's going to be for the next whatever hour, hour and a half. You know, kind of plateaus. And that to me is being stoned. So like I said, to me it's different. And vape cartridges don't really get me high. They get me lightly stoned. And another thing is, I don't know why, but they always hurt the back of my throat. Like I'm always coughing and clearing my throat. As it is, I'm always clearing my throat on the show anyways. Because when I'm recording, I'm drinking coffee and the milk, you know, creates a little phlegm. But anyways, um, yeah, I don't know what it is about the cartridge. But once again, it, they're just uh, they're just not my thing. Now, they do have a place, you know, if I have to go to some really square event that I can't be smelling like I'm smoking joints outside, then yeah, I'll take a vape cartridge with me. But other than that, you know, I really don't gravitate towards a vape cartridge. I, I want to challenge any vape cartridge company out there to uh, send me a good vape cartridge that's going to get me high. Please, send it in. Send it in. And if it works, it really gets me high, I'll talk about it. No problem. Now let's take a look at my social media. There's uh, something I really want to talk about that's local. And it is the upcoming puff and paint that's being put on not just by Happy Trees Art Class 805, but they are teaming up this time with Rolling Fatties Art Academy. All right, I'm going to read you the flyer that they sent me. It says, join us for Lompoc's first Rolling Fatties Art Academy. August 18th, session starts at 420. Art class starts at 6 p.m. You get one edible, one pre-roll, one good time and art supplies it is a 40 dollars donation and you must rsvp and you can do that on instagram at rolling fatties now i suggest if you can you should go because i've been to a couple of these art classes from happy trees and they put on an awesome cannabis event man diane and cheyenne really know how to put this thing together last time they had a musician out there during the session a guy that goes by the name of thursday island psychic charity really great musician never heard of him before but since then i've been following him on instagram and i really do like a lot of the stuff that he puts out there also at the last puff and paint they had uh Sian khan mayan cuisine as the food vendor and I, you know right after i smoked my joint i bought myself a plate of what are called panuches i believe they look like tostadas and they're kind of like them but a little different either way they were really good so yeah if you're up in the lompoc area that is i guess that's considered the north county of santa barbara or if you're even somewhere in the 805, man, get people together in the vehicle and get out there. It is a really fun time. Am I going to be there? Maybe, maybe not. It's it's kind of a traveling weekend for me. Um, I'll see what I can do, but I'm not sure. But either way, you should go. You you really should go. It's a lot of fun. I, I've always met a lot of really cool people there. I've always had some great conversations. And I've always gotten really fucking high before I start painting. So it's a great time. So like I said, go over to Instagram and go find Rolling Fatties. That is R-O-L-L-I-N underscore F-A-T-T-I-E-S. Rolling Fatties. All right, now let's do the report from the Cannabis Frontline. And I'm going to read part of an article that I found over at the Marijuana Moment. And the title says, Congressional Bill Would Let Some Students with Marijuana Convictions Keep Financial Aid. And this was written by a Kyle. His last name is either Jaeger or Jagger. So, is that the way you spell Jagger? J-A-E-G-E-R? I thought it was Jagger. Anyways, either way, uh, he's the guy who wrote it. And it starts off, Under current law, students with drug convictions can be stripped of financial assistance for a period ranging from one year to indefinitely, depending on what type of offense it is and how many prior convictions they've had. The new legislation, sponsored by Representative Bill Foster and Gwen Moore, is titled the Second Chance for Students Act, Students convicted of first-time cannabis possession without intent to distribute would continue to receive financial aid if they enrolled in an approved rehabilitation program and complete it within six months. 
Okay, remember that little bit about enrolling in a rehabilitation program. Goes on to say, Moore noted that existing laws put students at risk for losing aid if they are caught possessing any amount of cannabis. That consequence can be devastating and often determines whether one can remain in school, she said. It's why I'm thrilled to support this bill because the marijuana conviction shouldn't jeopardize a student's future or access to educational opportunities. However, some advocates feel the proposal, while well intended, perpetuates a stigma where marijuana consumption is automatically treated as a substance use disorder that requires rehabilitation. Those arrests for minor marijuana possessions do not need to be treated as substance abuse or should not be legislated as such. Justin Streakel, policy director of Normal, told Marijuana Moment. The intent of protecting students is admirable. However, the senseless assumption it projects upon cannabis consumption is for madness. Now that brings up a really interesting point when I was reading this. Because I can see the argument of why, why are they treating cannabis possession as if it's a substance abuse problem. You know, they don't treat alcohol like that. If you're, if you're found passed out on campus from alcohol, they're not going to put you in an alcohol treatment program, at least not right away. But at the same time, I can also see where the government's coming from. They're doing their best to help students who get caught with marijuana while marijuana is still federally illegal. You know, and since a lot of financial aid does come from the fi come from the federal government, it is a good idea. Now, I do think that this should be revisited once cannabis is legal federally. Once cannabis is legal federally, it should be treated just like alcohol, in my opinion. Because both cannabis and alcohol are used by a lot of young people to party with. I mean, not just by young people, but by a lot of people to party with. It's not just medicinal. I mean, to me, this is kind of the best option that they could put forward. Now, what do you think? You know, seriously, reach out to me either on Instagram at inmygrow, send me an email, inmygrow@gmail.com, And there is a link in the show notes so you can read the rest of the article. So as I mentioned earlier, I have a conversation with Joe Grow. He is someone that I've been trying to get on the show f for a while. I sent him an email to come on about a year ago. And he just got, and he got back to me not too long ago, and he was really excited and really thrilled to have a conversation with me. This guy knows a lot about like natural farming techniques, making activated teas, just a lot of different things, man. I first heard about him about four or five years ago when I was learning about SIP irrigation. And that's a whole other thing you can look up over there. There is a link in the show notes to his website. There's a link in the show notes to his YouTube channel. His YouTube channel has a lot of DIY stuff for gardeners. But he was cool enough to come on the show and have a conversation about LABS, which is short for Lactic Acid Bacteria Serums. Not just that, but we also had a great conversation about chelated bottle nutrients. So hang tight for a couple of minutes. I'm going to play a little bit of music, and then I'm going to put that conversation on for you. Well, I saw it's just a ride. Well, I saw it's just a ride. Just a ride. Well, brothers and sisters, get this. I've got someone on the phone with me today that I've been wanting to get on the show for a long time now, and that is Joe Grows. If you don't know who he is, you need to do yourself a favor. Click on the links in the show notes that are about him. And go to his website and see what he does because him and his website are just this fountain of knowledge when it comes to natural farming techniques. Joe, brother, I want to welcome you to the show, and thank you for coming on. Thanks, Alex. I really appreciate it. For sure, man. Now, I found out about you. I found you about four or five years ago. I was helping a medical cannabis patient figure out the best way she could grow her own medicine at home, but since she did have mobility issues, she couldn't. there were some times where she couldn't get around too well, and she didn't have a lot of space for, for her cannabis grow. We decided the best thing for her was a sub-irrigation planter. And your Facebook page was a huge help in that project. Uh, so awesome. Uh, yeah, no, thank you for ha putting that out there at the time. Now, but you're no longer affiliated with it, or you no longer run it? Is that right? Yeah, I'm not on Facebook anymore um, at all. I just, uh, it, it was just taking too much time uh, overall, uh, and I wanted to be able to help people in person. Wow. Yeah. Well. Yeah. That, it it does take a lot of time. It is it is quite the time suck. Facebook is. Uh, now, I, I wanted to, I I wanted to talk to you, to help me better understand, um, lactic acid bacteria serums or labs, 
yes. and and mostly why they're so good for our plants, not just cannabis plants, but all of our gardens and all our and all aspects of farming. Well, I'd love to give a quick overview on that. Um, the easiest way to understand labs in the soil is actually to understand labs in the human body. Uh, lactobacillic uh, is a you know bacteria that's friendly to our bodies. Inside of our guts, there's millions of bacteria, and what the lacto does is when you populate your gut with uh, lactobacillus, it lets you break down the foods more easily that you're eating. Then your body can actually absorb those foods more readily. And also, as a result, when you have more good bacteria, there's no room for bad bacteria. So it pretty much crowds it out. Now, you transfer that same concept into uh, living soils. Uh, what does lactobacillus do in living soil? Well, it does the exact same thing because soil is just like a stomach, okay? You have millions of microbes just like in a stomach, and what it's doing is breaking down and cycling those nutrients from all the dry amendments and other organic matters that are being broken down, and it transfers them into a usable form for the plants to uptake readily. So that's the first thing it does, okay? Um, the second thing that it does is in that same process, uh, you create a better mycorrhizal fungal layer on your roots. So you have this symbiotic relationship that's occurring. And so essentially your food source for your plants, you can use less food and you'll actually grow more yield because they can absorb more. Uh, it's really no different than a healthy human gut versus an unhealthy human gut. Uh, it's really exactly the same concept. So the other thing is a slow release of nutrients. You know, when, when a person pours a bottle into a, a dirt, uh, you know, it's, it's not slow, <laughs> it's instant, and it's also chelated. And chelation uh, is, is a form of forcing your plant to take up something that it really isn't ready for and doesn't actually need or want. Um, and, it, and it forces that to happen. Labs can't really work alongside bottled chemicals. So if you're a, a user of, of bottled nutrients off of a shelf, um, unless it's 100% organic with no chelation, uh, it, it, they're not going to work well together. Labs cannot be used with chelation for a few reasons. One, there's no food in chelated chemicals for the microbes to eat. That's number one. So they can't thrive. Number two, because of the salts, it actually kills the microbes that you put in there. So really, putting labs into a bottle-fed type garden is kind of useless. What you want to do is, is start with a good base living soil mix that has all the organic compounds and dry amendments. Then when you're adding the labs, it will break down those dry amendments into the usable form and make them much more readily available to the plant. Um, so, yep, that's kind of the base overview on labs. So, um, so speaking of, of the chelation part, is there a way, like, let's say somebody started a grow and in, in vegetative on a bottle nutrients and then they want to switch over to labs, is there some kind of buffering period that would have to happen or just feeding them or just giving them water? Or should you just finish the run with what you have and start fresh with the labs if that's the way you want to go? Uh, well, I mean, that is a really great question. Um, I mean, it has a ton of answers to it, too, because it depends on, on the person that, you know, is growing. For me, if I, let's say I inherited a plant from someone that they were growing with chelated chemicals, I would take the plant out of the dirt and wash off the dirt down to the root ball and replant it in living soil. Oh, okay. That's just what I would do. All right. If somebody doesn't have that ability to do that, they're like, I can't then, you know, you could switch to a organic fertilizer and then use the labs alongside it. But also just be aware that, you know, if your organic food is already pre-broken down, then the labs can't break it down anymore. And so there won't be any food for them. A lot of growers use cocoa and cocoa being, it's just like a block of nothingness. I mean, there's no nutrient value. There's nothing there. Uh, for your microbes to thrive. So, you know, so it wouldn't really be beneficial to put them in there. To make the transition, you really want to start with your soil because it's really the soul of your plant. It's really where where it all starts. So also, if we make that transition with that soil, it, it, 
I, I believe it'd also be a good idea to add some extra microbes into it. Some some kind of you know, like maybe some mammoth pea or something that'll just kickstart those that microorganism life. I mean, those are those are all things that can be used alongside. I personally don't find that I need any other I don't use any bottled chemical at all. None. I take all my dry amendments off of the shelf and I make a living soil batch and I cook it. And when I do that, I actually put lactobacillus acid directly right into my living soil. As I layer it in, I spray a layer of lacto and molasses. And then I put another layer of dirt and another layer of lacto and molasses. And I just keep doing that. Um, and then they, they cook for a good 30 to 60 days. By the time that soil comes out, it's so organic and fresh and you can almost eat it. I mean, it sounds crazy, I know, but it just smells good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, I like the so, passion. I like the passion. You could almost eat it. But uh, now, now, speaking of other mediums, is labs not ideal for cocoa? I mean, it's not ideal in cocoa by itself, no, because there's nothing there. There's, it's just a void medium. And that's because you picture cocoa, cocoa, you have to picture it like as if you're in hydroponic almost. Because cocoa really doesn't have anything that'll hang on to any of the nutrients. Well, yeah, that, you're right, definitely. And there's no organic compounds in it to break down. Like, it's just, it's a carbon. So it's already at, it's broken down to like it's pretty much its lowest form. Um, you know, they need a good uh, source of something to break down. But I use cocoa in my mixes for aeration as one-third part of my mix. I'll either use cocoa or peat. Right, yeah. That's kind of, yeah, anyway, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, and that that's the thing. If you want to um, understand the labs, labs are faculative anaerobes, so they will survive in either oxygenated situations or without oxygen. And so I've had a lot of people ask me, well, what about hydroponics? I say, well, labs won't do anything in hydroponics because the nutrients is already broken down into an absorbable form for a plant. So really, it can't do anything. It's just floating in its own, well, waste, kind of. So it's not really beneficial in a hydroponic setup. However, you can create hydroponic nutrients from labs. So what you can do is you can actually create a biofilter and you can soak your biofilter medium in labs and molasses so it's populated with labs. And then you can actually run dry amendment lechate through the biofilter and it'll break them down into nutrients and you'll have hydroponic nutrients without any particulates. Oh, oh so, wow. Okay, yeah, because that particulates could wind up just clogging spray heads or whatever else people are using to for their hydro well plus system. they're probably organic compounds which would be breaking down you don't want that in the hydro you know but you can have a 100 percent organic hydroponic grow i've done it with this by creating a biofilter for me i haven't needed any other like microbe inputs just the lactobacillic acid bacteria serum labs just that and using it to make my other ferments See, if you take that, the labs, labs is just the very foundation. You get going with labs and you start to understand what do labs do. Labs break things down. You put that into, uh, you know, a ferment. Like I have a ferment that I have continuously going. It's a five-gallon bucket. And if I take out one quart of, of the juices to put into my five-gallon bucket to mix and then I top drench, then I replace that with one quart of fresh water and I just let it continue. And I add new new vege uh, vegetation to the top of my bucket. And when I say vegetation, I mean like all my garden scraps, all my food scraps, anything that's not citrus or meat. I just keep adding it to the top and, you know, and it keeps a white layer of fuzz and it just keeps breaking down and breaking down. And, uh, yeah, it's basically you can have your own continuous nutrient for free, I mean, <laughs> with kitchen scraps. So I, I so. understand. I understand why you don't want any meat, but why not any citrus? Uh, citrus requires specific microbes to break it down. So, like, it's going to kill off a bunch of your lacto just because of the citrus itself. So, oh, really, citruses it. are a no-no unless you want to cultivate your own citrus ferment where you stick to only citruses. That's possible. I haven't personally done it though. Oh, okay. I, I got it. All right. All right. So do me a favor. Now, I was over on your website, 
and I was checking out just your basic labs recipe you have. Do you want to do mm-hmm. me a favor and uh, can we go over that recipe? Sure, absolutely. Uh, yeah, the very first step is just to get uh, two cups of rice and a, uh, or sorry, two cups of water and a cup of rice, and just put it in like a mason jar, and you shake it around for a good five minutes till it gets that nice milky kind of um, rice wash, and then you strain off the rice itself so you just have the wash and you just take a napkin double it over or triple it or quadruple it whatever you can and uh, just cover the top of the mason jar with it with a rubber band Uh, we don't want any bugs getting in there but we want it to breathe and so you go ahead and put that in your laundry room or top of your fridge or wherever you prefer and uh, let it sit for a good five days to seven days you'll see like a white coating on top and for me this is a deal breaker. If I see green, I start over. So sometimes I just make two so I don't have to worry about it. Uh, the green is not good bacteria. The white is. So if you had green in it, you can still create good labs. Um, I've done it in the past where, you know, I didn't have time to make another one and I put it in. But I notice it stinks a little bit more, slightly different smell, not quite as pure. But if it's a 100% white layer on top of the right rice wash, I've always had excellent results. Then from there, now you've got your rice wash portion, and you just put it into a five-gallon bucket or smaller, and you put in a gallon of milk, uh, you know, organic. As close to the cow is, is the best. And after you put in your milk, uh, then you're going to seal the top, and you want to put an airlock. Some people have said, why would you want to put an airlock? Because uh, a lot about fermenting is about collecting bacteria. The problem with labs are you're not collecting bacteria. You're replicating a specific bacteria that you know. So there's no need to collect. Um, you've already collected lacto through the rice wash. And so you, you know, now uh, you put this all into a bucket with the airlock. Some people will prefer to put them in like a carboy. That's great too. And uh, other people... Uh, from the Korean natural farming community types, they will not want to use airlocks because they want to be purists, kind of, which is cool. I mean, I'm down. Uh, But for me, um, I mean, I live in a modern world, so I'm using my modern equipment to get the best results I can, and an airlock does that for me. So you leave that in the garage for seven days, and when the curd layer separates, literally you just take off the yellow kind of uh, watery layer that's below it, that's the lactic acid bacteria serum. How I do that is I have a spigot on the very bottom of my bucket, and so that way I can just draw it off, and uh, and I run it through a strainer. But the best part about it is, you know, you'll have a strainer at the bottom, and the cheese layer will hit the bottom of the bucket and pretty much stops the flow of the liquid, and you know, hey, I'm at, I'm at the end of my uh, labs. So you put that away. You can either store that in the refrigerator for about six months, they say, or you can mix it 50-50 with molasses, and it can be stored on the shelf. Now, now we're talking about the curd layer that's on top. We're not... No, no, the the liquid. The liquid that you drew out of the bottom is is what you're going to drench with. Okay, all right. Sorry about that. No, no, you know, no, and that's why I wanted you on, because I was reading it, and I was kind of unclear. I was like, wait, what am I doing with the curd layer? But yeah. um, no, okay. Well, and here's the best part about the curd layer, though. The next time, what you do is, is you go start your living soil batch, and when you do, I'm not joking, just take a good cup of that and you layer it in every six inches of soil or every three inches or four inches. You layer in the curds because what that's going to do is when you're cooking your soil, those curds are going to continue to break down, and it's basically just going to provide more nutrients in your soil. Your soil will just be saturated with, with <laughs> lactic acid. So. Oh, man, I like that. Nothing goes to waste, man. That's perfect. Well, the other thing is if you have chickens, dogs, or anything, they love eating the curds, and it's safe. I even think it's safe for human consumption, but I haven't personally been doing it because <laughs> I just want to make sure before I do. But I, I, I'm pretty sure it's safe for even human uh... consumption. Not a doctor. Sure. <laughs> yeah, no, clarification. Yeah, we're not doctors here. Um, okay, so then we store it, and it can be stored. You're saying if we stick molasses 50-50, like equal amounts, it'll store for about a year, those labs. Yeah. So now, yeah. is there, how much, do we need to dilute it when we feed our 
our gardens and our plants with it? Is there a certain amount like? Yeah. So like the base amount is, is one ta- uh, teaspoon per gallon. That's just the base amount. I tend to use more like a tablespoon per gallon. Wow. So, so you don't need a lot. Yeah. You don't need much at all. You're just, uh, and once you've got a healthy population already in the soil, you know, you're just adding to the population and adding to the population. A quick note, though, uh, if you're flowering, you want to stop feeding labs at least two weeks before you plan to finish your plants out. Because labs are such a powerhouse, they actually will keep your plant from ripening. They'll just keep feeding and feeding them, huh? Yeah, that's what it does. It, it just keeps feeding them. And one time I'm like, man, when is this going to finish? But the buds kept getting bigger and thicker and juicier. And, <laughs> I mean, they were sparkling like you could never imagine. And I'm just like, when are they going to finish? And they would never turn amber. They were always this crystallized, you know, color. And I, I ended up cutting them down and they were still absolutely fabulous. But I kept wondering, man, what did I do wrong? Well, I found out. The labs were force, well, essentially feeding them to such a high efficiency level that they weren't ripening. <laughs> nice. Wow. Well, hey, it's a good thing to know. Yeah, I appreciate that part. Yeah. Oh, that's huge. It's huge. You know, another thing is, is to, it, another part to the labs is you can also take it, you know, from the most basic thing, you can take it to so many different levels. Um, you know, there's activated labs where you basically mix labs, molasses, and water, and you ferment it for a continue another period of time. And activated labs, I mean, every lab inside there is no longer dormant. They're not asleep. So you're getting the full force of the labs. They're hungry. They're ready to populate. They're ready to go. So activated labs are definitely <laughs> a high thing on on my list because uh, it's like taking what labs was and supercharging it bottom line. Wow. Um, yeah. So I definitely would look into that <laughs> if you're going to be doing it as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, so but yeah, overall the bottom line is you don't have to worry about when you're dealing with labs and, and living soil, especially if you choose to use a SIP, a sub irrigated planter, you will be blown away at how often the system just works. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to add any chemicals. You don't have to do anything. I put ferments as a top drench and labs. That's it. I have not bought a bottled chemical or any nutrients at all for more than 10 years. Labs are the heartbeat of what I do. So, you know, if you, if there's anything I can say that somebody could take away labs are the heartbeat of your plant. I mean, seriously, it is a world of difference. The medical benefits alone, I mean, the same bud grown with, with labs and the same plant without labs, completely different medical value for the same exact medicine. It's like, what? How? You know, the labs made it so the plant could uptake what it wanted at its time rather than us saying, well, here you go. You need this chemical. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Yeah. And the medical value is just incredible. No pHing, no salts to flush out, no negative impact on the environment. You can't go wrong. It's it's a really great way that of farming. It's a really great thing to know. Now, I, I was over at your website, uh, thefermentationfarmer.com. Is that right? Yeah, thefermentationfarmer.com. So I yep. was I was over there and I saw you had different recipes for fermentation like fermented fruit juices uh, fermented plant juice on that you just build on top of this basic labs recipe that you just went over right well it does depend on which ones because like for instance there's a lacto ferment where you you're using labs to physically extract all the nutrients out of the plant material um, and that is 100 percent built on labs so you just have your labs and then you basically mix labs with molasses and water and you pour it over the plant material and then in in about a week or two you have you can draw off the liquids and what you have is raw nutrients i mean it's ready to go it's already been pre-broken down and so that's that's how you do a lacto-based ferment but there's also ferments that are more like true to the korean natural farming community and those are when you use sugars and the sugar Believe it or not, the brown sugar, when it comes in contact with, uh, with plant material, through a chemical process, it actually creates osmosis and extracts the 
uh, available nutrients out of the plant material and into the liquid solution. So it's much, it's actually a different process. Um, people tend to blend them together, but they're not the same. I've done experiments where I mix the two, where I did, oh, I did, you know, sugar, 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 and all that just by the book layering. And, uh, and then I added like a few, a little bit of lacto also to mix the two. And it did turn out good still. It turned out good, but I found out that all the plant material was being eaten up by the lacto. So it was like falling apart and getting all mushy instead of when you do a traditional Korean ferment with sugar, you know, it's really easy to strain off all the plant material. So, yeah, they are quite different, uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's all about how deep you want to go down the rabbit hole of uh, natural farming. Absolutely. But another thing uh, that I also saw over there that really kind of piqued my interest was you have a recipe for a saltwater fermentation. Oh, yeah. And, and just to preface, any any recipe that I put on that website, it's actually just handed down from like several generations. I mean, this isn't anything I make up. This is stuff that came down from thousands of years of people growing crops and caring about the land. So uh, with that in mind. But yeah, I, there's a seawater ferment where you you essentially ferment your seawater and uh, and what that does is draws out the mineral contents from within the seawater. The sea is so rich with minerals that you you know you can't get in dirt. You know by using the fermented seawater, you can have the the mineral content inside your soil so that when your plant's ready to eat and take up, it can it can have that stuff readily available. And the really impressive thing that I saw on there when you described what they were, what it was used for best, <laughs> it's got nothing to do with plants, but it's good for chickens to help them not lose their feathers. I'm telling you, man, it, it's <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that's that's a there, there's so many uses where farming for food and having animals go hand in hand. Like I said, you know, when you make a labs batch, if you don't have a place for that, um, for the curds to go, your chickens will gobble that up. Your dog loves it. Heck, I, I'm, like I said, I'm probably going to start putting it in some caplets and eating it myself at some point just because it's, it's pure lacto. It's pure, uh, serum and it can help, help your body to uh, repopulate its gut bacteria also. So healthier us makes healthier gardens as well, you know? Yes, it does, man. Um, you know, I may not be a vegetarian, but everything I eat is, I think the saying goes. So, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. the better we feed them, the better I feel. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, I can't say enough about labs. And once you can start down that, that trail of, of ferments, you can get completely away from all bottled nutrients. The beauty of it is, is when you look at things like you know, the, the soil, the living soil, you have to buy amendments to put in there. I mean, not everyone doesn't just have like, oh, huh, five pounds of alfalfa sweet. I mean, no one, you know, you don't have that in your backyard probably. <laughs> you know, so there is still a cost involved. But I'm telling you, I, I helped a garden here in the local Portland area. They told me that they're saving like almost $8,000 a year in nutrients. And it's all now they're growing all organic, 100%. So that's so awesome, you know. man. That's great to hear. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, that's the thing that you'll find when you go to a dispensary and you get some herb from them. Some the medicinal quality is just not there. I mean, I just can't find it. And when I go and smoke my own homegrown stuff that I grew with these principles, it's the best medicine I've ever had. And it's not that I did it. It's just this. You know, this form of growing, it, it works with the plant in a symbiotic way. The plant can take up what it wants to when it wants to, and there's no chemicals and there's no damage to the environment. It's a win, 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 win. You can't stop winning. Yeah, and also, uh, you know, the whole thing about the dispensary cannabis is also it's, it's – lab seems a more cost-effective way to grow cannabis because, I mean, growing cannabis out of bottle nutrients – it's gonna it gets expensive, and if you're Absolutely. a commercial grow, you know you're buying fifty five gallon drums at a time of some stuff, and all that cost just you know down the pipeline straight to the consumer man. It's all just part of your overhead. Where if you invest a little bit of time to build these lab systems, I think that cost would really come down. And like you said, you'd have a much more flavor for a richer product. 
Well, and if you combine that with SIP, with a sub-irrigated planter, if you set it up right, I mean, you literally don't have to even do any work. I mean, work as in, yes, you still have to take care of your plants, but the, you know how traditional watering, well, let's face it, it's a pain in the butt. Well, yeah, let's, let's, let's <laughs> talk know? a little bit about the principles of the sub-irrigation planters, you know, because, you know, it's known as SIP, and, you know, part of that's because it, it, it works on the capillary action. Yeah. Well, and it works just like the earth. You know, the earth has water underneath and, you know, the contents of that water is trapped inside of rock and caverns and so forth. And it leaches up into our ground soil through, you know, little pockets and so forth. And, you know, you're really just creating that exact same environment. So you have a dirt layer with water underneath. One thing I have been finding out that I think is really cool. I used to always uh, have all my reservoirs empty, like meaning they were just had the liquid, the water, you know, water and labs. And that works okay. But the problem is I noticed that if you're in an outdoor garden and you're, you, and you're in an area with slugs, slugs like to go in your reservoir. That's a no, no good. That's yuck. So anyway, long story short is, I found out that if you fill your reservoir with lava rock instead, the whole thing, and you fill it one inch above your res so your dirt never touches the actual water, and then you'll hollow out little pockets in the, in the rocks where you'll put, you know, uh, some wicking points that will wick the water up into the area um, where the plant is. And so basically, uh, the lava rock, why do I like the lava rock? Okay, here's why. The lava rock provides a place for the microbes to take refuge. So it's between the water and the soil. There's about a one inch layer of rock that isn't saturated. And your microbes can kind of go in there and make homes in all those little holes and crevices of the rocks, just like in nature. And then they can come up into your soil and feed and then, you know, make the nutrients available and then they can go back to their home down below. So I just feel like it provides more you're basically just giving uh, more stability to your microbes. I also noticed microbes that were floating inside of my, my reservoir. I took a scoop of my reservoir water and put it under a microscope, and there's about a bazillion microbes just floating in there suspended. And I'm thinking, this can't be really how they like it, you know? So when I put the lava rock, that goes away. There's no more suspended microbes because they're on lava rock. So, I don't know. I've really been getting into the lava rock thing for my reservoir. Yeah, it's really heavy. Don't get me wrong. But uh, yeah, if you do it and you basically just emulate nature, it, it works really well. Yeah, it sounds like it would. That makes that makes sense when you, yeah, I guess they wouldn't like to just constantly be swimming in something. You know, we all want a place to rest. Right. Well, and the, you know, the open res style, it works. It's. I mean, I've grown some amazing flower, food, everything. I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't work but if you have the choice and you can just throw some kind of medium lava rock hydrogen whatever uh it, it i feel like that's better than having an empty res yeah it's less you get less water less available water can be in there because now there's all that rock but uh what it's giving you uh what it's giving your microbes and what it's doing it's, it's much more like nature you know than having a hollow water spot yeah, that, like yeah, it makes sense. It it truly does. Hey Joe, I, I want to thank you very much for getting on the phone with me and talking to me today about everything. Uh, oh man, my pleasure. It's been awesome. I love it. It's my passion. I'd love to talk about farming and gardening anytime. Hey, do me a favor. Can you let everybody know how they can find you and how they can find all this information? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm available. You can find me on my website uh, at uh, thefermentationfarmer.com. Um, I also have a YouTube channel where I'm doing uh, living soil side-by-sides and things like that. Um, if you just search YouTube for Joe Grow, it'll pop up. And, yeah, if, you need, if anyone needs to contact me directly or needs anything, uh, any help, uh, greenpassionfarms at gmail.com. Far out, man. That's, that's great. Hey, so talking about those living soil comparisons, you're doing side-by-side of how many soil mixes? Uh, right now I've got five of them that are in motion. But uh, I'm trying to get them all going at the same exact time so that it's an exact one-to-one. So, like, in other words, I don't want to leave 
uh, one batch for three months and one batch for one month and try to compare them because the decomposition levels will be different. Um, right, so I right. want to basically get all five of my mixes. The ones, the, the mixes I'm doing are uh, Coots mix, the Revs mix. I'm doing the, uh, what's his name? Uh, Subcool. There we go. Subcool's uh, super soil mix. And I'm doing my own super soil mix. I just call it the Joe Grow mix because that worked. And uh, and then uh, there was one other lesser known mix. I think it was called Moonshine Man mix or something like that. But basically, they're all living soil mixes that combine organic uh, amendments and so forth into a living soil batch. And the, the secret that that a lot of these people who wrote these living soil batches, they don't understand the secret of, of labs. I, I don't think many of them do because they don't mention it. When you take your soil batch and as you're making it, you get it all mixed up, you get it on a tarp and it's looking really good, all the components are together. Then you go to put that into like a 27-gallon tote, you put down your first three or four-inch layer, and then you put a layer of lactic acid and, you know, labs and um, molasses mixed together 50-50. And you just keep doing that every three, four inches. And those labs will make that stuff break down so fast and so rich. When you open that soil container in one month, it looks like an award-winning soil. Not joking. And it smells like it. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I, I can't wait to see that. I, I want to invite everybody to go find that and, and check out how that goes. Well, and also if you're into hydroponics, I, I encourage you to check out my video on how to make a biofilter. Um, because seriously, uh, I've, I've been playing with it and I'm going to continue. I don't have any side by sides yet, but I'm going to do a living soil side by side with a 100% bio, uh, water grow. So like basically hydroponic nutrients made with my bio filter only. And I want to compare the two side by side and see, um, what kind of results I can get. Oh, well, that's going to be cool to see, man. That'll be, yeah, that'll be really interesting to see. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be fun. So I haven't really gotten a chance to do it yet. I'm in the process of, of moving at this point in time, so it's been a little bit hard to get done with the, the side-by-sides. But my goal is in the next couple of months to have all five side-by-sides going in a cabinet with the same strain so that uh, we can really compare. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely be checking that out, Joe, man. Um, again, thanks a lot for getting on the phone with me. And do me a favor, don't go anywhere, don't hang up. Everybody, okay. everybody else, I'll be right back. Was that cool or what? Come on, man. I love talking to Joe Grow. That, that guy's awesome. You know, after I stopped recording, we still kept on with this long conversation. You know, we talked about all kinds of things, man. IPM activated teas you know he told me more about fermented fruit juices so needless to say he will be back on the show um i did invite him to come back on because there are a few other things that i'd like him to help us understand to to help teach us about so uh so keep an ear out for that and i'll let you know beforehand if you have any questions for him send him in i'm sure he'd love to help so go find him uh, go find his website that is the fermentationfarmer.com and his YouTube channel goes by the same name, The Fermentation Farmer. Yeah, do yourself a favor, man. Go look this guy up. Let him know you heard about him on the show. Well, guess what? That's all I've got for you today. That is, that's everything I have to share with you today. And if you have a question or a comment about this episode, send an email to inmygrow at gmail.com or find me on Instagram at inmygrow. And I want to thank all the artists who let me use their music to put the show together. I really do appreciate that. And don't forget, if this podcast has educated you, entertained you, or even given you a little escape from your day, go over to patreon.com slash inmygrowshow and leave a financial donation. Okay, I use that money to pay for hosting fees, to buy equipment, so I'm able to have these conversations with people and, and, you know, help them educate us. If you don't want to leave a donation at Patreon, go over to inmygrow.com, click on the support the show tab, and you can buy a t-shirt. Or before you go shopping to Amazon, click on the Amazon link in the show notes, because this will let Amazon know that we sent you and the show gets a commission. Now, if you can't support the show financially, don't worry about that. I get it. But here's how you can help. Subscribe to the podcast wherever you found it. Subscribe to the website, inmygrow.com. And then subscribe to the YouTube channel, In My Grow, And tell three other people about the show. It's real painless. 
Also, if you are a cannabis company that wants to advertise to our worldwide audience, do me a favor and send me an email also that is in my grow at gmail.com. All right, hermanos y hermanas, my brothers and sisters, I'm going to get on out of here. You know I love you all very much. And remember to always grow, learn, and teach.